imagine being able to connect with nature that's all around you beyond seeing it and and watching it but actually being able to listen to it listen to the nuances that it's telling you tuning into the wild animals that are coming across your fields and even the life that's happening in your backyard or maybe in your garden elkter is a visionary of connection to all of life she is a champion of nature wildlife and animals She's also a filmmaker and an author and an extraordinary human being. I'm deeply grateful and honored to share this conversation with you to help you deepen into your inner wisdom, your farm, your garden, growing your own food, nature, wildlife, and all life around us for the whole planet, including humanity. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, founder and editor in chief of Heart and Soul Magazine. Thank you so much for tuning into this interview with Elk Durr. If you haven't subscribed to our YouTube channel yet, be sure to like and share the videos, subscribe, tell your friends about it. It helps it get seen, helps really amplify the regeneration and generation conversation. And if you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soul Magazine yet, head on over to heartandsoulmagazine.com where you can join our community of heart and soil for just $39.99 a year. Enjoy the conversation. Elka, it is an honor to be having a conversation with you today about wildlife, animals, uh, farming, gardening, and how we're all connected. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Yeah, it, I'm really excited about it. Before we begin, Alka, can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into being a voice for wildlife and animals? Yeah, I grew up on an organic farm in Germany. Um, we never sprayed or used fertilizer or anything. We um, used the old methods. And as a kid, I remember collecting ladybugs because we had tons of them and putting them on the field so they would be natural in um, um, controlling the, the aphids or balancing the aphids, I should say. So we did a lot of that and everything by hand and uh, the old way. And it was really awesome. And I remember loving the earth so much and loving my life so much and the smell of the earth and being out there and um, also realizing, well, um, we really care for our domesticated animals and we care for the earth, but we don't care for the wild life because we, we see them as vermin or we want to um, eradicate them. And I tell you a quick story real quick. They did, um, they did preemptive strikes against the foxes because they could have had rabies. So instead of really checking on that, they just killed them all. And yet I knew where they lived <laughs> and I didn't think it was right. And mm -hmm. I knew where they lived and I would basically occupy the fox den and say, over oh, my dead body, are you going to kill them? Because I saw them play and I saw the pups and it was just so beautiful. And they didn't have rabies. And all these diseases, they come from a human imbalance anyway. You know, so we yeah. should have looked at the root cause of that and looked at our behavior. But there was no awareness and no consciousness. And it really is all about a new age of waking up and being more conscious about all the players that we live with and not just the human players. And so I basically, you know, they carried me away or they, or I fell asleep or whatever, but I was occupying fox dens as a kid, as a kid so they wouldn't kill them. But of course they kill them anyways, but nature is so amazing. And like within two years, um, the population was back up because the females, instead of having three to four pups, they had 10 to 12. And if they had 12, 10 were female. And so it's the same with the coyotes here in the American West and everywhere. Um, you know, when we, when we air bomb them and kill them from the air, they, they come back anyways. And, um, because nature wants to be in balance. Nature is really mm. wanting to be in balance. And now mm -hmm. we need to be a player too. 
uh, in the whole thing and take our our rightful place on the banquet of life again and not just take but also contribute and uh, we need to take over the care for this earth from Gaia. Gaia has cared for this earth long enough. Now we need to be a player because we are also divine. We are not just human, we are also divine. And if we bring that connected part in, then life can be so beautiful. And there won't be any lack and there won't be any any shortages. Everything we need will be here. And um, so I decided you know, like, because the animals would always talk to me, all life would always talk to me. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to that. And from the get go, I want to encourage you, please, please be yourself. The more we open up, the more we'll be privy to being able to uh, communicate with all life on this planet. So please, it used to be stigmatized. It used to be not wanted and people were being hurt for being like that. But now I can only say it's the time to be who we really are. <laughs> Sorry mm, <laughs> to be so lengthy. Well, but, yeah, I, I wanted love to bring that. that. Yeah. I love the presence. I love the presence that you're bringing to the opportunity to work with wildlife and hear how we're being talked to. Some people might say that they feel guided, that they they just have mm-hmm. an inner knowing or an inner wisdom. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. the language that we use is a little bit different and it's all pointing and opening up towards the same yes. thing, right? Mm-hmm. So I it's just, I love how you, it is, mm-hmm. it is our birthright and, uh, and we're all interconnected. And I love what you said, you and I have talked a little bit um, on our own about how, how farmers, um, are connected or disconnected from wildlife. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to bring you into this conversation with Heart and Soil is a lot of the times we think, farmers think that it's just about um, getting what we can from the ground, whether it be food for our tummies or food for um, a livestock or, or, or food for uh, the warehouse or the buyer that's buying all the food. Uh, that's kind of the mindset of a lot of farmers. I think that's changing and I don't think that's true for all farmers. Um, in, in general though, that's kind of the disconnect that's happened in our in yeah. our space and even in gardening too, right? How do we get rid of the mold and how do we get rid of the vold and how do we get rid of the, <laughs> the things that are in the way of growing our yeah. garden or like, uh, or the raccoons that come in and like eat the corn, <laughs> that kind of thing. So the small gardener <laughs> also experiences this disconnect and connection with wildlife. And so I'm wondering how can we, how can we come together to really work on that? Well, first of all, I want to say it's not a certain group of people ever that is doing um, unfavorable things. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. It's not the farmers, the ranchers, the environmentalists, or whatever. It's either the, the connected person or the disconnected person. And the disconnected person will wreak havoc, whatever they're doing. If they're farming or if they're CEO or if they're a parent, you know, they will they will not honor all life that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's not that farmers or ranchers are doing anything wrong. It's um, or and, the whole concept of right or wrong or anything harmful it's the person and I tell you a story about that I was part of a community garden some years ago and uh, immediately they fenced it all off right so we became a a vole sanctuary because now the voles weren't food sources for the foxes or the coyotes anymore they had a little sanctuary and they were thriving like crazy because all they had to go do was uh, go under the fence and uh, be safe you know basically from being eaten so then immediately you know the the traps and the um the poison moved in but i hadn't done it that way you know like i had said and they told me you won't have any yield for four years you have to toil and you have to do this and you have to spray and you have to do that and i'm like no 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 and i was working on a film about the last wild bison at that point and that's important to know i'll i'll come back to that in a second so i set up my little garden i blessed it i um 
I talked to the soil, I talked to all the inhabitants, and I said, guys, you can have 10%, you know, but the rest of it needs to be for me because I'm working for the bison, I'm working for all of you guys, and I need to be healthy, and I need to have some good food, so so don't come and eat it all, and uh, but have whatever, you know, like nourish yourself too, because you've been here before. And I felt all this love, and I blessed it, and I put all my love into my garden, and I put some prayer flags up, you know, and I decorated it, <laughs> and I and I built these amazing lattices for my beans, and it was just so beautiful. And then I was accused of harboring uh, voles, you know, because everybody else was killing them. So they said, they'll come to you if you don't kill them. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I said, guys. 10%, 10%. So as I had planted my garden, I I was being called to to go down and uh, work with the bison that had been, you know, like, it's a long story, I won't tell it. But anyways, I had to go six hours away and work with the bison and film there and um, witness, witness something. And I was called and I said, guys, when I when I uh, had blessed my garden and my seeds and everything and put them all in, I said, guys, I have to abandon you right away. I have to go work for the bison. What are we going to do? And the garden said, bison, voles, seeds, garden, it's all the same. It's all connected. We will work for you. We will we'll, we'll go all out. We love you. We love you. Keep going. So I did my thing and I was gone for three weeks and I came back and I had the most thriving garden of all of them. It was like a jungle. It was so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And all the young gardeners came to me because they had been told these old things to do and not to do. And they were like, how did you do this? How did you, you know, how did you work that? And how, 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 but anyway, um, so I've been working with the young gardeners on putting the love in. Because when we put the love into our work, anything, you know, it can be farming, gardening, filmmaking, mm. it's a whole other ball game. Now, it won't probably reach the masses at this point, maybe later in life or later in, in the century. But right now, you know, like it's important to work with those who have that connection and who are ready to do it. And part of my life's uh, work is not just... Um, working with the animals, but also affirming the people who have that in their hearts already, but are still hiding it out of yeah. fear. Because, you know, maybe cellular mm. memory of like, if you are like that, they think you're crazy. If you are like that, they think uh, something's wrong with you and you'll be, you will be punished. So there is some kind of that memory. And my grandma was always like, uh, protecting me. She's like, gosh, we can't lose another one, we can't lose another one, you know, we have another one, like my daughter, uh, we have another one, like my mom, she's like, oh gosh, how can I protect you from life, they're gonna kill you, basically, because she had those memories from world wars, you know, where people who were different were killed, and so was my aunt, you know, yeah. and so, um, so anyways, uh, the time is now. A friend of mine told me, she said, Elke, a few hundred years ago, you would have been killed for your work. Now you get to do interviews. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get to speak about this. And I'm really, I'm really grateful that the time has come mm -hmm, for yeah. us to, to come together in that way. And like I said, it might not be mainstream. It might not be on TV, but uh, mm -hmm. it might still be kind of weird. But there's so many of us that have that connection. All it is is yeah. being connected to ourselves and our yeah, inner knowing so and our inner self. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. nothing weird about that. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, yeah, it's so true. There's a couple of things that came to mind when you were talking about um, people having that inner wisdom. And one is um, when is one of our contributors, Glenn Elzinga from Alder Spring Ranch. He can't, he when he was first ranching. And I'm paraphrasing his story really simply. When he was first ranching, he thought he knew how to do everything, everything, and he was really focusing on, um, you know, the, the 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 hay production and the feed production for his his animals. And he was, and uh, and and he was even, I'm, he might have even been farming organically already at the time. But then he started to notice 
um, just different things about how the elk move through his land, where they had their babies, the time of year he, they had their babies, um, where they would graze. And so, and it just really made him pause because he was like, huh, they are having their babies in the spring and their babies survive and they thrive and they do really well. And I'm here out in the middle of the winter <laughs> with snow in on Canada. the ground. <laughs> well, no, he's actually in, in the States, but in the Northern uh, States. So close okay. to Canada um, and uh, fighting against nature to keep these ca calves warm and to do all the things. And so he totally changed the way he uh, calves out his, his herd now they have out uh, in much more natural ways and he learned to mimic the elk and mimic the na nature what he saw and subsequently his farm is just like uh it, it's become this pro prolific oasis of of connection and not just um not just in that way but but so far beyond and they look for to nature for answers and for guidance all the time on his farm now and i thought that was so powerful and then another story that came to mind when you're talking was um, when I first came out to Saskatchewan and I was farming a mixed organic farm and, and we had cattle and a lot of people around who had cattle, they don't like coyotes on or near their cattle. And I grew up, uh, on a farm where I always felt really connected to nature and we had like wildlife around us all the time, maybe not, um, like bears and stuff like that, but we had coyotes and I never felt threatened by them, but it was always so new to me to see and hear about people killing coyotes uh, to protect the cows. And um, but on the on the family farm that I was a part of, they actually had coyotes that ran with their cattle because they felt like they were part of uh, the protection of their cattle and the nurturing of their environment. And so I thought that was really really powerful that they could actually see that and experience it. Yeah, it's awesome. I knew uh, 90, he died at 94, but he was in his 90s when I met him. I knew a rancher in southern New Mexico who um, never had a kill, a cattle kill, neither the calves nor the, um, the adult cows, uh, because he uh, also worked with, um, with the land and with the animals and his dream always was to see a Mexican gray wolf. I also did a, did a documentary about the wolf um, that we're coming back to that area and he's like, I want to see one. It's my dream. It's my dream. It was his, um, it was his, his way of being on this earth. And he's, he told me that, um, that his neighbors were air bombing the coyotes um, with uh, air from airplanes and killed them all. But they had the most cattle kills because then the inexperienced, um, basically teenager coyotes moved in and they didn't have any elders to teach him anything. And so they killed the calves. So it was really because there was a vacuum, you know, yeah. and, um, and so they, they, they could never be on top of it and kill them all. And he never had a kill in all his years. And it was just amazing of ranching there, probably 50 years or so. And wow. he, yeah, because he, he worked with nature and he probably did the same I did. He, he would say, you can take out some old, sick and weak ones or whatever, and, uh, yeah. but leave me the rest, you know, because, um, because it's the same um, with cattle as with elk and other uh, prey animals. You know, the wolves only take out the old, sick, weak, and uh, sort of genetically not intact ones, right? Mm -hmm. So they keep the herd strong and healthy. And uh, I know of a story where, um, where, um, where they checked on, on the kills and they always were sick. So even if they killed a cow somewhere, they were sick. They had they had a problem. Because here is the thing too that I want to say that's very important to me. We, um, our our cattle, our now domesticated modern day cattle, mm -hmm. comes from the our oxen in Europe. That was a wild wild creature. Stood stood six foot tall at the shoulder. And they're still mm -hmm. finding ceremonial horns that our ancestors um, used for ceremony of them. They were huge. But 
we bred everything out of them. All of their intuition, all of their skills made them small, docile, and standing around. So now we really have to take care of them. We can't bring them back into the wilderness. They don't have the skills anymore. When I was filming for the wolves, I saw this one little calf standing around, following me around. And his mother was half a mile away looking at me like, I should do something. I should do something. But I forgot what I did. What should I do? And I said to her, you know, like I could be a cattle thief. You know, I could be anything. Take care of your baby. Take care of your baby. So, but she, she forgot. She forgot what to do because we had bred them for docility and we're doing the same with the bison. And now we need to take care of them. Anybody and anything that we have messed with and have altered, we need to take care of now. We can't throw them back out into the wilderness without skills. Mm. Either there has to be a range rider, like a, they call them cowboys in the olden days or cowgirls or whatever. Right. Or there has to be, you know, like some enclosure to put in, you know, put them in. But we can't just throw them out without skills. Mm. They die even without wolves, we had so many cattle deaths here in the West because they yeah. eat bindweed and their stomach explodes. They don't know what to eat, you know. They fall off a cliff. They they don't know how to find water. And yeah. um, they die of thirst now that we don't have so much precipitation anymore. And so, anyways, that is something I want to mm. get out there, you know. Take care of your domesticated animal. Please. Yes. And that's what my yes. friend did. And that's why he never had a kill. <laughs> he had all yeah. these people working with them. <clears throat> yeah, that was the same with uh, with the cameras. Their farm was a century farm. And I don't think they had ever um, a kill by coyotes or wild wolves ever. Yeah, and it was mm-hmm. because they they let them they let them um, be a part of their natural environment. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, Alka, because you are you you've done um, some incredible work with the wolves and with wildlife, and now you're working on the migratory path for bisons. Can you tell us a little bit about that? That's in that's in a um, where does that start? Like how far south and does that start, and where does it go up to? And we're talking um, we're talking in North America, right? Yes, yeah, it starts in the Arctic actually with the polar bears. Mm -hmm. They're going south now because they are the highly specialized um, animals. They're the youngest bear. They have only been around 100,000 years, and they came because of the Ice Age, and they came about because of the changing conditions on the planet, but they came from the brown bear. And now they're migrating south to mate back with the brown bears where they came from. So when we have another ice age or when something uh, is conducive to them being on this planet again, they can probably come back. So Mm -hmm. there is a migration all the way from the Arctic uh, all over (laughs) and in in Europe as well. You know, basically all the animals are adapting to changing conditions. And we don't have these large herds anymore like millions of bison or or hundreds of thousands of elk or whatever. We don't have that anymore. And by the way, people from Europe came here uh, 100, 150 years ago just to see the large um, herds of animals. And they called it the American Serengeti. So just to give you an example, you know, what happened here just recently, not that long ago, what we had, you know, and what can still come back, maybe not in that magnitude, but mm-hmm. uh, what we can still foster returning for the health of the land and for our health as well. Because yes. um, because now so many people always want to come to where the wild animals are because they can feel their connectedness and their intuition. And they are still totally intact. I call them intact. They know what to mm-hmm. do. They, they don't freak out ever. They don't ever say, oh, my God, I'm getting old or or it used to be different. Oh my gosh, it doesn't rain as much anymore as when I was young. No, no, no. They're adapting. You know, their intuition kicks in and they are immediately adapting. What are we going to do next? Where are we going to fly to next? Where are we going to migrate to next? It's the same with the birds. The birds are just flying yeah. overhead now, right now, as I'm talking about them. There's a hawk and a raven dancing. Wow. And I know now why 
that's why it didn't work with the interview in the house. I had to be outside, basically. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Because they're all here to support this interview. So I anyways, um, yeah, and there's coyotes and there's another bird coming now. Yeah. So anyways, um, um, they are still intact. They know what to do. And it would be really nice rather than annihilating them and being afraid of them and wanting something from them, you know, wanting their intact energy to find that in ourselves first and then go out and communicate with them because we can't really take it away from anybody else. We can just take it from the inside of ourselves, from our mm-hmm. own wisdom and from the wisdom of the ages that is that is accessible to all of us, really, it is. So, so yes. Yeah. So I'll... Elka, um, the way you're speaking, I think people yeah. who, who are already on that path or connected in that way or maybe curious about it, they totally get what you're talking about. And then there's people who are like, what? <laughs> and Or yeah. they're curious. And so how does a person deepen into that? How does a person become more connected in the ways that you're talking about of being able to feel that connection to wildlife or hear what they're asking or telling us or and and you know not just the wildlife but the the vegetation that's around us the trees that are mm-hmm. around us the yes. soil that we're working with yes um, the communities that we're in so how do we deepen into that yeah that's a really good question thank you for that i was going to touch on that because i don't want to sound ungrounded because my work is totally grounded in my experiences mm-hmm. and in my daily living so first of all i would say we all come in with that uh, connection. You know, when we see it in the children, it's amazing. They are talking to nature. They are totally, they are totally connected. I would say leave the children alone in that regard. <laughs> you know, let them be themselves. Let them express that. Don't say you have to give that up because now you're 10 or you're 5 or whatever. You know, because it's there. And um, they just stop being that because... Um, because life is is difficult, you know, like in the mm-hmm. schools, they can't, they can't stay like that. They have to adhere to a certain norm. And then adults, too, I can see where people were shutting down because it wasn't uh, wanted uh, from society or family or whatever. Or that's, uh, it wasn't valued, I should say, you know. But I, um, I speak with young people a lot, and I say, you know, like, if you really want to do something with, with animals or with the land, do that. Don't do a different job and then do this on the weekends. You know, it'll split you mm-hmm. apart. You know, find your own path and create your life. And also, you know, take some time for yourself. Don't just listen to the news all the time. It'll take you off course, you know, because it's also horrible. It's also hard it's also difficult follow your own guidance and um and don't listen to um to kind of uh mainstream stuff too much you know like uh just sit down take some time to yourself especially now during the holidays or in the winter time i don't know when we're airing this but in the winter time i would say you know like uh take some time and be with yourself and listen to yourself and if you feel so inclined to some meditation maybe some quietness it also helps to be totally like appreciative and grateful of life i found you know if we start our day saying oh my gosh that's how i usually start i'm still here i just love this i love being here i love being on this planet thank you for another day i just uh, uh, can't wait to see what wonderful things are going to unfold today. And then we access that different part of ourselves that is not in constant fear, that is not in constant worry about, oh, God, what's going to happen? Because change is actually a good thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And we've always changed and evolved. And I would say, um, you know, like just follow yourself you know, and what comes out of you and watch nature like that gentleman that you that you mentioned, you know, um, there's a lot of people like Aldo Leopold, he saw the green fire die in a wolf's eyes that he killed. That's when he noticed, oh my gosh, 
you know, there is something more to this animal. It's not just killing my elk and deer. You know, there's something else. This animal had a purpose here. So yes. maybe when we when we see the larger purpose of nature, we just sit there in quietness. We can find our own as well. And it's a very grounded thing, actually. It's it, it's a lived thing. It's not um, a concept or anything because your whole life will change once you see these things. You know, and you will live differently. You will live um, in a more connect connected way. And the first thing also is like to to have the intent to see things and to have the intent to to know who we, who we truly are, you know, because we are more than just fearful, worried little little humans. We are uh, we are also immense wisdom inside. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like that. So what I'm hearing is to create a quiet space and reflection to have intention to want to learn and intention to open up and intention to hearing and listening and watching nature. Yes. Yes. And watching oneself and our own rhythms. See, yes. because we are out of our own rhythms. And I've seen that the other day. We are just forcing ourselves to, to eat three artificial meals every day that are totally processed. To, to wake up to an alarm clock that just uh, just scares <laughs> yeah. um, all of our surroundings, you know, like instead of maybe like to, to a nice little sound or something, instead of, Wah! you know, kind of <laughs> yes. a nice sound of nature maybe or something like that. Oh, we've, we've become so artificial, you know, artificial light all the time. Mm-hmm. I love winter and I sit in the dark sometimes. You know, I don't need 50,000 lights or whatever. I'm like, wow, this is nice that it's dark. And then my sense of of, of vision is better because mm-hmm. I can see in the dark now. Because I always say I don't need a flashlight because then I can't see. Because it's only this, <laughs> light, this tiny little circle. I yeah. want to see all of it. All yeah? of it, yeah. So, mm-hmm. so it's like we have so many senses and we have so many uh, abilities you know, going on, but we are not using them because we we follow a kind of a rigid, unnatural schedule with everything. Yeah. You know, and um, and uh, this is the time you can eat. This is the time you can go to the bathroom. But our body has the, you know, I saw that in the schools when I was working in the schools. You know, like this is the time. This is the time for everybody. But we have our own rhythm. And it's so good to get into our own rhythm for sleeping, for eating too, you know, like, like, uh, again, children, they still know they won't eat when they're not hungry, <laughs> you know, <Just> because <laughs> That's right. it's lunchtime, you know, or they get, they get so entrenched in something that, um, that, uh, that they're not hungry, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that nourishes them on another level, you know. Because we only think that food nourishes us, but so much more than food nourishes us. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. Being hungry actually wakes up different parts of the body. It, it awakens yeah. uh, different parts of our, uh, our cellular regeneration. Mm-hmm. Yes, 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 yes. And we're regenerative beings, you know. It's not yeah. like because we've done something for a long time, we have to keep doing it. Now we can... <laughs> We can change and we can regenerate, right? And it's it's so great to see what our our own needs are and follow them. You know, now I have a need to be away from noise or whatever. Mm. Or I have a need to be away. You know, and sometimes it's not possible because we have five kids or we work in a school or we we have all these deadlines. But there is always, I found, you know, a uh, a way to make a little space for space <laughs> and once we have some space then other things can move in and then other superfluous things move out <laughs> you know because we have a lot of fillers too we fill our lives you know yeah, maybe yeah. watching so much tv is not necessary or maybe um excessive um socializing is not necessary you know so but we can always find that out you know when we listen to ourselves and to see what we need 
Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Make space for space. It's really, really, yeah. really powerful. So Elka, how can we as farmers, gardeners, stewards of the land, stewards of the earth, caretakers of the earth, how can we be supportive in these migratory pathways for the bison and for wolves and for all the animals that are, that we are sharing this space with? Because um, there's a, there's a presence for us to be more mindful in how we're growing our food and how we're stewarding the land. And in that, there's a really important space for wildlife and nature, like nature beyond the nature to be honored and to be present. And so I'm curious, how, how can we show up more wholly and more intentionally to work with that migratory process and, and the animals and the wildlife? Yeah, I would say don't be scared if animals show up on your land or around your land that you haven't seen for a while, you know, that you've never seen because um, they're looking right now and they're, they're going somewhere. And it's actually a great way for us to adapt as well if we watch them. What are they doing? You know, where yes. are they going? And how are they doing things? How are they adapting to changing times? You know, and how are they? Um, how are they working with uh, with life? Because they're so instinctual. They're like I said, they're still so intact. They are following an inner knowing, and they just know, and they don't freak out, and they don't um, yeah. worry, and they don't go into fear at all. You know, they just adapt. And so, uh, what we can do is just um, just welcome them as much as we can, not go into fear that they're going to eat your your livestock, um, uh, really guard your livestock, maybe have a dog, you know, there's all these wonderful dogs that if they grow up with your sheep or your cattle, they think they're part of it, and they will bark and they will tell um, the wild uh, predatory animals, oh, this is my place, you know, I live here, and then they leave, you know, and so... It's not a big deal. There's flattery. There's there's flags you can put up uh, that are that are kind of moving in the wind, and they will also deter other animals. And um, so there's a lot you can do to protect your livestock, and they need to be protected anyways. You know, mm -hmm. you need to have an eye on them uh, to see if they're healthy and what's going on all the time, anyways, if they're out there. So um, so you can really support that by by not um, by not doing much of anything really, but just watching them and leaving them be. Sometimes they just move through, and it's actually an honor and a gift if you see um, like the footprint of a of a wolf or whatever, you know. And more yeah. and more now, when I talk to people, they won't say it in public. Whenever when I talk to them, the ranchers or the inhabitants of the area. You know, where the animals are coming through, they're like uh, looking over their shoulder. They're like, okay, nobody's listening. Well, I have a wolf on my property and I really love it. You know, because they think they're supposed to not love it and supposed to oh, kill no. the wolf to fit mm. in, basically. But that's not the case because if they only knew that everybody, almost everybody is telling me how excited they are. <laughs> so then I tell them, yeah, your neighbors are excited too, and those neighbors and that rancher. And, you know, so, so let yourself be that child that is excited about something other than domestication moving in or through, you know, because yeah. that, also, that also activates us and brings out something really intact in us. And that also helps us to live. Because why would we have 8 million people going through Yellowstone every year if, if they didn't want to, um, to um, um, somebody was just driving, but uh, if they didn't want to, to get a glimpse of that, if they didn't love it, if they weren't like, uh, like excited about it. So let your inner child, your, your little child, come out and say, hey, this is so cool. I have land where there's wild animals. There's so few people anymore who, who get to see this. And watch that pattern and guard your livestock 
and um, and see what happens because I don't know what's going to happen either. You know, I just know they are looking for a place to live because their old place is too dry, or or they um, they're giving us another chance. You know, basically, because a hundred years yeah. ago we didn't want them, so now they're trying again. Is it oh, okay man. now for us to come? You know, because yeah. so yeah. Um, to give you an example, in the very south, um, you know, there have always been lots of different species of wild cats. And we were so afraid of them, even though they never kill livestock, basically. They kill the javelinas, which is like um, a wild pig-looking animal. Mm -hmm. And they kill the, the the deer, you know, the old, sick, and weak ones. But they never really do anything to us. And uh, yet, we were so afraid of them. We came from Europe, and it's like, okay... Let's do it. Let's do it like in Europe, you know. Let's pre-kill everything, you know, <laughs> in case, just in case, do preemptive strikes, you know. And so also nowadays there's all these organizations that will reimburse you if an animal kills one of your livestock. So go to mm. them and get reimbursed if something happens, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. Don't worry about your livelihood because once you are in – um in tune with all life around you, they will all support you, actually. That's and, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I like yeah. my garden. And um, yeah. and then you don't have to worry about that. But when, when you start taking things out, and that's all binary culture, good and bad, weed and vegetable, wolf and dog. You know, like one right. of my friends from high school, when I showed my wolf film in Germany, she said, I couldn't do what you're doing. And I thought first, you know, she... She would be afraid of wolves or whatever. She said, no, I love dogs. And I'm like, well, what does that have to do with the wolves? You know, you can love, love dogs and wolves, you know, weeds and vegetables because they all yes. have, yeah, it's all one. And that's another big thing that I wanted to, to mention. You know, we are moving out of the binary. You know, yeah. there is no good and bad. You know, the mm -hmm. weeds have their purpose too. The... The wolves have their purpose too. You know, we can live with it all, all life, all life. We don't have to say me and my dog, me and my sheep. You know, that's too yeah. small. That's way too yeah. small. You know, um, yeah. me and all life. And how do I fit in here? Yeah, it's almost like the disconnect from nature has become so grandiose that it is reconnecting us to the reverence of that awe of the wolf for example, like your friend yes. was talking about. It's really powerful. Yeah, mm. because I saw one of these big cats. I woke up with a startled, like, go outside, go outside. And I always, that's another thing, follow your impulses. That's that's your inner guidance speaking, you know? Like, it was still dark. I woke up. I went outside in my nightgown, and I saw this animal, you know? And I thought, that's a funny-looking wolf, you know? Like, why does, does it have whiskers? Why this long tail? And it was a cat. It was a big cat, you know? And if I hadn't followed that impulse, a big wild cat, right? It's very wild. And so, yeah. um, because I'm also working with the wild cats, and, and so this big wild cat um, was there. So I could see what they're really like in the wild and what they're really, um, what they're really, what their purpose is, you know? And if I hadn't yeah, followed my yeah. impulse and said, oh, I'm going to just sleep a little bit more. What is that? You know, I would have never met the cat <laughs> because they're That's nocturnal. Amazing. And, and they're nocturnal. And during the day, they can't just move through because they get shot, you know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. and so yeah, it's really, yeah. it's really interesting. If you are, if you feel that excitement when somebody wild comes through or when you're in the wild, foster that because that's also a part of you yeah <laughs> it gives us a whole new way uh to grow our food elka when we think about gardening and we think about farming and we think about um all beyond the soil that we're working with it's really really powerful yeah it is because the health of the land will go up exponentially if all the players are there or most yeah. of the players 
or more players than we usually have, really, really, because it is all connected, and you're right, and um, and also when we do it right, you know, with our food source growing, then we need so much less food, you That's know, like right. one tomato grown with love on the vine is, is better than 10 from the hot house. You know? like, yeah, yeah. So much nourishment. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I think that's one of the one of the pieces that attracted me to biodynamic farming when I was first um, learning about it um, and listening. Actually, more listening to people talk about it when I was little is how um, it was. It was almost a. It was uh, it like it was honorable for them to see a diversity of wildlife on their farm. Like it, yeah. it meant that they were doing something right, and so it was excitement when when they yeah. saw um, anything from like rodents to wolves to bats to um, elk walking through their field. So it was, yeah, it, it was something oh. that's always really connected me to yes. the biogenetics. Yes, yes, it's yeah. so much richer, you know, than, it is. than a field where you have everything growing in rows. I was a tree planter growing up in Germany and I had to plant along a row you know, three for one oak, three for one oak, because that's what the industry needed, right? Mm, but that's mm-hmm. not what the soil needed, you know? So they would rip out if I did three oak and one fir, you know, just for to loosen it up a little bit, you know, because it was just so human head planted. And it was so, um, pla- uh, and planned. It was so uh, lifeless, you know, now mm. when I look at it, there's no undergrowth, there's no birds, there's no, <laughs> that nobody wanted to live there because it was just such a monoculture, you know? So anyways, um, it wasn't allowed to grow by itself and, and to have all these tears and to foster all this, these life forms. And I have a really funny story to tell you too. So, um, so our neighbor um, has, had taken to alcohol a lot. So he didn't clean his forest. I always had to clean the forest on Saturdays, pick up every twig and and every tree that had fallen and and I and it was just so dead, you know, so lifeless. But our neighbor who didn't clean because he didn't have the physical capacity because he was doing other stuff, his little plot was thriving so much because uh it wasn't clean. And it wasn't uh, tended to in that in that way of like a living room. <laughs> you know, it was alive. So I always thought I wanted to be like him, and I didn't know yet what what that really implicated. <laughs> but I knew I didn't want to clean up for us when I was growing up. Uh, that's amazing. And it's not again. It's not that binary, either wilderness or mm-hmm. um, straight rows. You know, of the mm-hmm. one thing. You know, where where like the um, uh, the um, the fields of all the uh, almonds in 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 California, now where they truck in the the bees, you know, because there's mm. only one pollinate, and they have to take them back out because there's nothing to eat for them after a certain month right. when everything has bloomed. You know, so you know, like make sure there's other things growing too, so the bees can stay and they don't have to be in a truck and get seasick or whatever from driving around, you know, and uh, right. and losing their losing their homes, you know, like there can be an and. It's not either mm. or. There can be an mm. and. And that is my vision and my hope and, uh, you know, the way I live, that it's inclusive, that it's an and that we have become a part again you know that's not this is the field uh of this this is the field of that no that um that everything can grow together and that's how i always Mm. plan i ask which plants want to be together because they don't want to be alone (laughs) in in their own family they want to be with other plants you know and uh because then these plants will get the bugs away from them or whatever, you know, these companion plants. And also one of my biologist friends told me that plague of, of so-called like locusts or, or other insects, you know, mm-hmm. um, their job is 
to take out aberrations in nature, and monocultures are aberrations. That's why bugs descend upon monocultures, because it's an aberration. It's their job to take them out. And that if we have more plants together and more animals together, then there's less disease and more balance, and we don't have to spray because they balance yes. each other. And I've seen that's that. A, yeah, that's such a great point. And it's really exciting to see that coming into um, even more of the, the larger scale farms as they're doing intercropping now, you know, like yeah, peas yeah. with wheat. And uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really neat to see. Yes, yes, it's really, yeah. it's really awesome when, when we, when we um, use the wisdom of nature. You know, yes. and um, and um, and internalize it and use it in our lives as well. I think that mm -hmm. is really that is really awesome. You know, mm -hmm. and when we don't come from fear, what's going to happen if this happens? And and uh, I have to control this and this and this. But just kind of watch how it interplays. You know, and and balances itself out by itself. I think we can learn a lot from them from that you know so I'm out there a lot watching 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 spending time and um and gathering that wisdom <laughs> so thank you Elka and just before we wrap up is there anything else that's really on your heart that you'd like to share with us that we haven't covered today um yeah I just want to say that um the humans are important on this earth mm. and we matter and you matter and don't ever underestimate the power of one connected person of one connected human on this earth and see your own worth and cultivate that and uh, from there will flow so much for you and for all life it's, it's amazing so start with yourself and honor yourself and um and know that all is well really um that it isn't as we think that everything is so horrible all is well and as it should be and we will move forward from here and we've come a long ways just in 50 years <laughs> mm, agreed agreed yeah thank you elka namaste thank you namaste. thank you mm -hmm. Grateful you joined us for that conversation and interview. If you haven't subscribed to Heart and Soil Magazine yet, head over to heartandsoilmagazine.com. Click on that subscribe button and join us for just $39.99 a year. You make yourself an amazing day and I'm really grateful you're part of our community.